Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for June 26th, 2023. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Uh, Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Secure My Research with Anurag Shankar, Will Drake, and Tim Daniel. Because this is a group presentation, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, uh, participants are welcome to type questions into the chat. We'll be tracking the chat as we go along, but we also are setting aside time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. And with that, I'll hand things over to Anurag. Anurag, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette, and welcome to all of you. Hopefully your Monday is going well. Um, so we'll do introductions in, in sequence. Uh, my name is Anurag Shankar. I work at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research at Indiana University. Um, I'm a researcher by training who ended up in a career with IT security and compliance. And much of what you're going to be hearing about today is kind of uh, has its origin in my 25 years here providing these various services and also interacting with researchers across the campus, particularly in the IU School of Medicine. So with that, I will hand it off to Tim. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim, and uh, I was hired about a year ago to work with the Secure My Research team and help provide their service. Uh, and I, I came with a background myself working uh, in research for a contract research organization that ran phase one and pre-phase one clinical trials. So that's kind of what I came to them with. And so, Will, do you want to take it? Sure thing. So my name is Will. I'm a senior security analyst at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Um, I've been here at I, Indiana University since 2012, kind of got my start in an end user uh, tech support facing role, uh, eventually went on to more systems administration, uh, kind of securing I use telecoms infrastructure, but I, I missed uh, kind of working with people and I also wanted to get into security. So when I saw an opportunity to join on uh, and help Anurag uh, create a, a service to help researchers, I jumped on that opportunity. And I joined CACR in 2019. So that uh, that service is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, and we're actually going to start with a, a few stories uh, from the wild uh, regarding uh, research. So we're going to share the screen and get our slides started there. So this is the effective cybersecurity for research, kind of telling the story about Secure My Research starting with uh, those five stories from the wild I mentioned. Uh, the, the first one we call Global Warning. Um, and so this story is uh, Dr. Susan Johnson is a highly respected climate research uh, researcher. She has written tons of key papers in her field. Um, and then so one day she's at home watching the news when a piece about climate change comes on. Uh, she she cringes when she sees the reporter talking with essentially her arch nemesis, uh, a, a global warming denier she's had tiffs with in the past. Uh, this guy is making his usual annoying and just wildly inaccurate uh, accusations about scientists and, and climate science in general. Then he goes and specifically names and blames Susan for faking some of the global warming results she published a few months ago. Uh, being the ever careful scientist, she essentially goes back and repeats her analysis and to her horror discovers that uh, this guy on the news is right and uh, the data she has simply do not support the claim she made in the paper. Word gets out from there that she faked her research. There's a big uproar in the local and scientific communities. Uh, her, research, her reputation as a researcher is severely tarnished. And then a few months later, uh, the security office does a scan and discovers a breach on the server that Dr. Su uh, Susan Johnson is operating under her desk. And uh, forensics reveal that a climate denier group got in and actually manipulated her data to make it look like she faked her research. So I'll pass it to Tim for the next story. All right, our next story titled The Farce 
The Office of Sponsored Research receives a subcontract that Dr. Tim Castillo in mechanical engineering had competed for and won from a vendor funded by the DOD to develop a new engine part for a Navy ship. Dr. Castillo was subcontracted to explore how to make the part more durable using a method his research is perfecting. The vendor is obliged to comply with something called DFARS, that's D-F-A-R-S, a DOD cybersecurity regulation which has to be passed down these contracts. The requirements arise after the award is made and Dr. Castillo has never seen DFARS before and can make no head or tail of what the controls mean or how to implement them. So he contacts the vendor to get guidance, but the vendor tells them they can't help either because they don't understand it as well. Next, Dr. Castillo tries in vain to get help from DOD and other authorities, and five months go by while people struggle to figure out how to deal with this issue. Because the funding was expected to arrive months ago, the whole project is now threatened. Next slide. So a uh, promising new faculty member, Dr. Lakeisha Jones in kinesiology, she hears about a funding opportunity, but it requires some preliminary work. Um, and to do this, she has to recruit athletes recovering from shoulder injury to test an exercise regimen that she has designed to relieve pain. The research involves the athletes installing an app on their phones and answering questions about things like the level of pain, et cetera. And um, what the app does is it uploads the collected data to a cloud service, which she can then access via the web to do her analysis. So she submits an IRB proposal. Um, it's uh, human subjects research after all. The IRB notes that since PII, personally identified information, will be shared with an external vendor, uh, there needs to be a third party assessment, security assessment of the cloud service. So the security office sends a questionnaire, uh, popularly known as HECVAT, actually the questionnaire that often academia uses, to the vendor and, and gets no response for quite a while. And then, uh, then the vendor has difficulty understanding the questions and the back and forth basically ends up taking four months. By this time, the window of opportunity has passed and Dr. Jones is so fed up that she simply drops the project and moves on. An opportunity that would have gotten her a grant and, and make her successful is lost. All right, for our next story, we're talking about Dr. Rizwan Shah in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Shah is involved in a large international study uh, on depression in third world countries uh, in Africa. So Dr. Shah's got a new colleague uh, from Cameroon that texts him, and this new colleague says he's just received some tantalizing new data that they can use together uh, for a high impact paper that's due the day after tomorrow. Uh, the only mechanism that Dr. Shaw's university provides to share externally, share data externally, is to request a guest account through the university. The process uh, to request this guest account takes several days. So knowing that there's no time to do this the right way, Dr. Shaw go goes ahead and provides his username and password on a piece of paper uh, to his colleague. Um, the colleague then proceeds to lose uh, those credentials. Since highly sensitive data is involved in this project and on Dr. Shaw's account, the incidents reported to the security office. Uh, the security engineer involved uh, complains, damn these researchers, they're such a weak link in the chain. Don't they know security is everything? Or another way we, we hear this regularly among the cybersecurity community is the biggest risk to research is the researchers. Next slide. All right, our final story, Alfie scripted. Dr. Melanie Silberberg in the Department of Surgery is working with patient data on her desktop. She was told by her IT person that the desktop is full disk encrypted, which gives her a great deal of assurance that her data is safe. She wants a student of hers to do a statistical analysis for which she has to transfer the data to the departmental file server, which she was told is also full disk encrypted. Not only that, she knows that the data goes over an encrypted connection. So she confidently transfers the data to a public sharing area, convinced that it will be encrypted when it arrives. After all, everything must be encrypted as they were told. But a few hours later, 
They're shocked to find that the patient data is actually fully visible to the whole department and now breach notification procedures have to be initiated. Next slide. So uh, these were a handful of stories. They might seem like they're kind of all over the place, but in fact, they do have something all in common. And that is that this is kind of the normal state of affairs on uh, research campuses, whether you know it or not. Um, in fact, things are often much worse uh, because really what's happening here is that researchers will need to, will do anything they need to to make sure that they get their research done because research is their job. And often what happens is due to this, how dynamic research is, uh, security offices at institutions really don't know what to do about research, so they often just choose to leave research alone and let them go about their work, which uh, results in its, in its own set of risks. So to address these itch issues, uh, we launched Secure My Research as a pilot in the fall of 2020. Um, we worked with our office, the Vice President for Research for this funding, um, who was concerned about loss of research competitors new due to the security concerns and new and more and more strict terms in uh, contracts and grants. So when we launched this service, we were really uh, truly unsure of how it'd be received by the researchers because it's so difficult to properly engage with researchers. Uh, we weren't sure how excited they were when we went to them as a new cybersecurity service on whether or not they were actually going to uh, start working with us or not. However, uh, three years later, we can take a look back and see how things have gone. And we're very excited and somewhat shocked to report that nine, over 90% of academic departments at Indiana University have been coming to us. Uh, it's kind of hard to believe, but it is true. Uh, and this number, looking at it another way, it's very significant because we've essentially had some measure of, measurable amount of risk reduction in almost all uh, research departments uh, at Indiana University. So here are some uh, other metrics about our service. Um, you can see we've facilitated over $310 million in sponsored research with a median uh, uh, amount of 541K per project. Um, what this kind of shows that's also really cool to think about is that projects that are worth up, up, up upwards of tens of millions of dollars can take use of our services, but even small and even unfunded projects have been coming to us to get, uh, to get help with security. Um, we've assisted stakeholders that support research, so we've even extended our services to groups with NIU that their main job is to support researchers, and we've kind of uh, helped them insert security into some workflows. Uh, we've also expanded our coverage beyond simply compliance-driven areas, even into research departments that aren't dealing uh, with restricted uh, or regulated data, and even into departments that are dealing with open science data. Um, and we've got, we keep track of our tickets and we've been able to provide security assistance throughout the entire research uh, workflow uh, instead of just very specific parts of research life cycles. And you can see there off to the right, we've got some quotes from both researchers we've assisted with, as well as research departments around Indiana University that uh, take use of our services as well. So looking at the service itself, because after we show those metrics, people are often interested in asking like, well, how much time investment or personnel investment are you having to throw at this? How expensive is it, is it to provide that service? So the uh, cost is essentially two FTEs, and that was mostly at launch, uh, because at launch time, we were spending a lot of time doing communications, planning those communications, and then actually meeting with all of the stakeholders that it takes to run this service. However, after we did that initial outreach and people started coming to us voluntarily, we were mostly able to just sit back and let our engagements roll in. And since a lot of those take uh, just minutes for us to answer, and so the research can move on, we've now been able to scale back and we're, uh, we're spending a little over uh, one FTE for now. Um, essentially just one person to answer tickets. And then when more complex engagements come in, we can you know, bring in more people as needed. 
one of the things that I would add to that is when we launched the service, I was quite concerned that the uh, the FTEs we had may not scale, uh, especially uh, in the unlikely case that we had lots of people coming to us. And what it turns out, um, what, what turned out was that Almost 80% of the, the questions or the tickets that come in, we can we can take care of them within minutes or or a day. So that means they and, and so they're so straightforward that um that, that concern basically has gone away. Yep. So hopefully we've thrown out enough information about how successful we've been with a relatively low amount of uh you know FTEs committed. Uh, that we've tantalized you into asking, what is our secret sauce? So we'll get into those, uh, the, the various ingredients in the sauce uh, next. So number one ingredient is just having a different mindset uh, to securing research. It's important to remember that the goal of cybersecurity is not cybersecurity in and of itself. Cybersecurity just in a vacuum it is not useful. The purpose of cybersecurity is to enable, sustain, and reduce risk to an organization's mission. And here at a research institution, that mission is research, not cybersecurity. So we've spent a lot of time uh, working hard to understand research itself, the research life cycle, and then the researchers as individuals and what, uh, what it takes to become a successful researcher. Um, so taking this, this first, this different mindset and reapplying it back to the previous story um, about Dr. Rizwan Shah um, and that data sharing. Um, in, this, uh, in this case, the best way to think about it is it was not the researcher's fault. Um, kind of taking out, taking the blame away from the researcher allows you to do a more proper root cause analysis here and figure out what could be fixed. And in this case, the problem was that the institution didn't properly anticipate the need for speed in research and didn't have uh, an instantaneous file sharing ability ready and uh, available for the researchers to take advantage of. The next component is understanding that researchers simply don't have the time to learn and implement cybersecurity themselves. Faculty are going are doing research on top of also teaching. Uh, the research life cycle itself also has its own time pressures, uh, from responding to solic solicitation, contract deadlines, publishing deadlines, and so on. So if researchers won't do or can't learn cybersecurity, it's it's not their fault. They have research to get done. So here we have uh, Henry Neiman of the University of Oklahoma, a slide from his excellent presentation on effective communication with researchers. We're gonna borrow heavily from that here. He's primarily talking about tenure track faculty, as you can see the, the title of the slide. And for example, uh, their timeline, their major pressures from their perspective, I have seven years, typical tenure track, but I actually have six years. The seventh year is finding a job elsewhere if I don't get tenure, but I have five years and the six years when my materials are evaluated, but I actually have four and a half years because it typically takes a journal article six months from submission to publication. So, and that's if everything is working now and working reliably. And you can kind of quickly see how those pressures researchers, uh, research faculty can face. And remember, they're also likely teaching during this time. So there's just so many time sinks for researchers, it becomes clear that cybersecurity should not be their job. So the answer is the institution must build in cybersecurity. We can do this uh, by building compliant and secure systems. If we want researchers to do something the secure way, we have to give them the tools to do it. And if we can make that the quickest and easiest way, if we can make the quickest and easiest way also the secure way, then the researchers will take that every single time and some of them might even be happy to do so. So it's not just enough though to build those secure systems. We have to be able to look at each research project as an entire life cycle. And that's where we have these long, complicated and diverse workflows. So using a supercomputer to perform analysis would be only kind of a, a piece of that 
puzzle, for example. They're also interacting with participants. They're working with external collaborators. And so if we give them secure and compliant tools to match their use cases, they can bring all of those together into an entire research workflow that's secure. Next slide. So the other issue that uh, that is there probably not just with researchers, but in general is how cybersecurity handles messaging. <clears throat> so um, with researchers, the, 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 the thing that we're doing is spending a lot of time making sure that that the messaging is such that, uh, it, the messaging is such as researchers understand, which is, which I can tell you is not the usual messaging of cybersecurity. So what we are doing is, here's what we, we talk about. We, we talk about us helping them making sure that the research is trustworthy, repeatable, and efficient. And these three terms, come thanks to Juan Welch, <laughs> our previous, the director of Trusted CI. And it's very important because what it's doing is the, the traditional language of cybersecurity is confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA. Whereas in, when you add research to it, then these things become important. If you, if you message cyber, uh, researchers in this, in this positive way, um, and then you add things like, you know, you won't be wasting time dealing with some some cybersecurity issue um, and you know writing grant proposals and, and that sort of stuff then that is something that positive message go, goes out so we don't actually concentrate a lot on cybersecurity we talk about getting research done quickly uh, you know uh, efficiently and and making sure that it's trustworthy uh, so the next component is truly casting the service as something that's here to help rather than just another group that's coming in to tell you what you're doing wrong and, and slow you down. Because um, if you come in uh, from the angle of as a governance group and really just coming in to try and be the police, uh, researchers at the, at the very least are just going to kind of put you off and not really want to listen to you. So we come in and we just say, we're here to help. We're not going to try and just identify and tell on you for all the things you're doing wrong. If we identify something like that, we'll help you uh, figure out the best way uh, to move forward and kind of fix that issue. But uh, we're not gonna be the police, uh, we're here to help. And that's been very successful. And you can see uh, we ourselves are not part of the cybersecurity governance structure or the data governance structure within Indiana University. We are the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Having that research, uh, being a research center ourselves is actually very useful uh, in kind of strengthening that consulting, not governance message uh, that we provide to our researchers and has been really helpful. Um, the next component is matching the pace of research. Um, I think Tim did a good job kind of showing the pressures that researchers are under. And it makes sense with those pressures in mind why sometimes researchers just come out of nowhere with stuff that's due tomorrow. Um, and in that, uh, we are able to, uh, you know, tailor our service to be able to match the pace of research. We often get uh, tickets or um, engagements that had previously taken uh, months for researchers to get through. And like I said before, we're able to answer some of their questions in minutes or days instead. Um, another example of how we're doing this is providing the Secure My Research Cookbook, which we'll show uh, here in just a second. So the idea behind the Secure My Research Cookbook is that researchers want answers right now. Um, there are uh, universities often provide things like a knowledge base, which give a lot of specs uh, and information about the systems available, but not necessarily what those systems are good for, or very simple step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that, uh, to use that system. So what we did is we created a cookbook. The cookbook contains recipes, and recipes are just simple step-by-step -step instructions to do exactly what a researcher is trying to get done right now. And that's also how we structured the search function of the Secure My Research Cookbook. So a researcher can go and just simply type in exactly what it is they're trying to do. Um, and they just click on it. 
it gives a bit of preamble just to kind of set the stage. And then it just goes straight into step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that specific task rather than spending a lot of time giving system specs and irrelevant information. So essentially what we're doing is we're hiding cybersecurity in by simply providing simple step-by-step -step instructions. The security is baked into those instructions. The researchers don't have to do extra things. Um, so using uh, this matching the pace of research and going back to a previous story, we're going to revisit the global warning story with Dr. Susan Johnson um, and her information uh, being maliciously modified. So in this case, what we would have done is uh, we could have sent her to uh, the recipe that Anurag had briefly showed on screen on how to make your data trustworthy, which is essentially just using checksums to make sure that the data has not been maliciously modified. On to the next one, please. All right. And then uh, one of the biggest one is providing one-on-one -on -one consulting. Um, researchers often uh, kind of know what it is they want to do. Like I said, they don't always know which systems or places it's best to do that on. Um, and sometimes it's one of those cases where there's uh, so much information out there that they're not even sure the right questions. So to essentially mitigate all that, what we do is provide one-on-one -on -one consulting where a researcher can simply email securemyresearch at iu.edu, uh, and we tell them just email us, we'll take care of you. So they email us, we set up one-on-one -on -one engagements where we understand their specific project and make recommendations uh, based on what it is they need to do and what options we have available for them. We also help them research if there's something not available at IU, we help them research possibilities out there and then uh, get those in place. Um, and we don't just solve uh, the single ticket. We help them with their entire research life cycle and their entire research workflows. Um, and then finally, what we do is we act as well, uh, advocates uh, for researchers. And this is essentially identifying things that are broken at IU or things that are slowing research down at IU. And we help uh, essentially take care of those uh, in the background uh, before they continue being a big problem to our researchers. Um, so a case uh, was that we actually had in the past on this advocacy was a researcher going through the IRB process. They were uh, performing research using a, a system uh, at IU. And there's an IRB question that asked um, about the system and if it had already been approved for HIPAA data and the person wasn't was unsure, so they marked something. And what happened is they ended up getting taken down a completely incorrect process as if they were the ones running the system. So not only did we come in, we helped them fix that issue within less than a day. We then went back to the IRB folks and helped them clarify on that form, the, the language on there. And then we also had them add, like, if you're unsure what to answer here, contact securemyresearch at ie.edu. So for component eight, keeping in mind that research is the mission, whatever we do, we try not to hinder that research. And it, it may have to be done slightly differently, but it's kind of all these things we've talked about where we sit down with the researchers and understand what is sensitive information and where the risks actually are, and then only apply controls as needed and we document it. So we and the researchers can go back and show that due diligence. We also prioritize finding solutions that fit their preferences. A researcher using their preferred methods will always be more comfortable and likely perform the research more efficiently, as opposed to having to learn a new system. And so kind of going back to that DOD contract case, uh, with the DFARS regulation that with the clauses that were passed down the contract to the researcher, with the unfamiliar control-centric language, it led to that lengthy delay and jeopardize the research project. And so for a sim situation similar to this, we sit down with the researchers to under understand exactly what they're doing. And sometimes we actually learn that there's not even any sensitive data involved, even though it's in the contracts conditions as if there is. So for example, we worked with researchers for a case where they were, they were utilizing public uh, Twitter data 
And yet it had that DFARS clause, which deals with controlled unclassified information and introduces many new requirements to secure that data on that assumption. So we were able to go back and help the researchers negotiate the terms out of their contract. But these situations, they do require that one finds the time to speak with the researchers and understand what the research contract is and what kinds of data they're actually working with. In some cases, it is necessary we build in these controls or in others, we help move them to compliant systems and develop complementary controls to satisfy the needs. Another thing we do, uh, since we've got the tools um, to understand compliance, understand these security terms in contracts and actually uh, you know, speed things up uh, after we've met with the researchers to understand their workflows, what we had to do is actually insert, insert ourselves into our institutional workflows regarding research to make sure we were there to be able to provide those services. Um, so going back to that previous case, Disturbed, uh, this was the case with uh, Dr. Lakeisha Jones in kinesiology with those athletes uh, using a third party app to provide information about uh, you know, pain they were feeling. This was a case where we um, could actually sit down with the researchers and help them identify ways to minimize the amount of PII going to a third party. So in this case, we've, we've actually had cases exactly like this where we've worked with the vendor to set up uh, a, a format where instead of PII for research participants, the researcher is providing like anonymized study participant ID numbers. Um, and then we also find other ways for any other parts of PII can just be anonymized information instead. And then the participants are just logging in with an, a study ID number, providing information about like pain ratings and all that kind of stuff. So now the vendor is receiving all non-PII and we also review their security um, in a very uh, quick manner, uh, accounting for the, the truth that now they're processing less sensitive information. So we took a case where it would have taken months for them to go through the standard security review processes and looking at the heck that and all that kind of stuff and working out contracts back and forth with a vendor. And we were able to turn that into you know, just a couple days of us uh, minimizing the amount of information that the vendor received so that the research project could move on much quicker. And this was essentially taken care of through the IRB processes. So all the researcher had to do was go through the standard process of going through the IRB process. IRB referred to us, and then we were able to simply take care of it. Um, so the result of us essentially identifying all these ingredients of uh, the Secure My Research secret sauce has resulted in researchers coming to us voluntarily. Uh, like I said, we just uh, we did some communications in the early stages, uh, answered a few uh, engagements, and from that point on, everything spread by word of mouth, and researchers have been coming to us of their own volition ever since. Um, and we're using, um, there are some tricks to doing this the right way. Uh, we recently switched to using uh, Salesforce as a customer relationship management platform. Rather than simply tracking tickets, we're really keeping information on the back end about what our engagements were with each of these individual faculty or researchers um, and kind of, you know, keeping track of just information about their project so we can really uh, have this as relationships with our researchers rather than just one-off tickets and researchers truly resonate with that we essentially become the security part of their research team and they keep coming back to us and they tell their colleagues about it and they come to us and we just form those relationships um, another big thing we do is we act as a one-stop shop again we tell people just email secure my research we will take care of you so even if it's a ticket that we wouldn't necessarily directly handle, we have all of these relationships with the stakeholders throughout IU, whether it's IRB, Office of Research Administration, Office of Research Compliance, Legal Counsel, et cetera, et cetera. Researchers can simply email Secure My Research. We figure out the, the relevant person. A lot of times we'll kind of handle that communication on the back end on behalf of the researcher. And then we just come back to the researcher with a solution rather than just punting them off to another group. 
Uh, one thing I will add to what Will said was, <clears throat> I think the most effective trick that we use, it's not really a trick, is when a ticket comes in, we tell the researcher, can we talk to you now, like today? Because of the fact that we can resolve these 80% of the cases in a few minutes, uh, in cases where they can talk to us that day, their problem is resolved that day. And I think this is probably a very big reason why they keep coming back to us, because this is basically, this is something that's disappearing from this world, as, as we all know. And so by almost going back to fundamental principles, uh, just, just very excellent service, uh, we are able to meet the pace of research and also do that human thing. And, and it, makes, it makes all the difference in the world. So we, we were gonna write a small short paper, a few page paper to uh, publish in something like EduCause. And, and uh, when, when I started to write, uh, it was 25 pages before I <laughs> realized this wasn't something I could easily contain within, within four pages. And also I really wanted to write down the whole process and transform it into kind of a guide uh, so if you read the paper, it seems like this is this cool uh, procedural thing we did. And of course, it didn't quite happen that way here at IU. But since we have it, I wanted to put it down in a format that could be used or bits and pieces of it could be used, or at least the ideas and the information in that could be used by someone that wants to, to implement it at their campus, so the, so there's a, it's published through the Educause library, and and the link is there, and I think it's Janet's going to make the presentation available, so you can feel free to go read that. Another thing what we're doing is if you're familiar with the Trusted CI framework, and some of you probably are either involved in implementing it or at least are familiar with it, we're kind of actually converting this this thing into kind of like a framework for just for research cybersecurity in the form of these musts. And we're kind of working on it, trying to go through, to think through these things about what would be absolutely essential. What is the minimum that you need to do in order to be able to actually secure research? I mean, I mean actually reduce risk in some, some measurable way. <clears throat> uh, and, and so that work is, is continuing. There has been a lot of interest in, in this is, you know, what we're talking about here, Trust CI webinar now, but we've been talking about it for the last three years. And a, a lot of campuses have come to us and have asked for help. And, and there, there is such a, um, you know, su such a lot of work that we have done with some of them, or at least, at least these ideas have started forming in our head that this is something that we could do especially now that we have a little bit of FTEs available, that we could actually provide this as a consulting service to, to the community at large. And so we're kind of we're kind of starting some pilot projects like this with some, some campuses. Or again, at multiple levels, some campuses want to simply replicate the cookbook. And, and the thing that, that perhaps Will didn't say explicitly, the difference in, in the in the way the cookbook is just a simple, uh, you know, it's a knowledge base. But if you recall when knowledge bases came about, and I distinctly remember, in fact, it was the IU knowledge base, which I was accessing from someplace else. I was not at IU. And I said, what an amazing idea that I can type something and the questions come back and look, there's the question I wanted to ask. So the same idea now, except when you type in a keyword, what comes back are things you want to do. And, and I didn't realize that's actually a very powerful concept as well, especially when you have time, when you don't have time to look through, you know, like do a Google search and you have to go through all these different, you know, content that comes back. And the knowledge bases are, are, are great places where you can, you know, so for example, if you, if you search for supercomputers, then our knowledge base will give you all the names of supercomputers. But if you're a researcher, they have no clue what the heck that even is, then that's not gonna help you. They know, what they know is what they want to do. I want to process data. Okay, that's what everyone knows. And so the, the cookbook basically is translating that, 
for them and and what what it's giving back to them are things they want to do so 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 some people want to implement that and they are the the key intellectual property if you want to call it but we're you know it's available for free are the use cases of the recipes we call them so you, know, you could take the recipes and then of course just just map it to the solutions you have on campus and so some we're helping some people with that and and again with some campuses i think we're kind of in 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 talks with perhaps doing a cyber research cybersecurity assessment of the campus to see what components they have in place and then making some recommendations and and perhaps in time maybe even helping sitting through some of their engagements and and providing some help and so forth so so this is kind of you know, something that we're going to be working on over the next next year or two so that's the that's the the talk we meant for it to be about 45 minutes long and i think we're we did pretty good and so i will stop sharing and uh pass it back to Jeanette <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so we have time for questions. Let me pull up my community updates so we can give people a moment to type. Um, our next webinar uh, is July 17th. Um, that's a little early. We had to work a little earlier in the month with our presenters. Um, our topic is on software assurance. We've got some updates from Bart and Alyssa, um, who are members of Trusted CI. They operate out of uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I will see some of you <laughs> um, at the NSF Research Infrastructure Workshop this week. I'm actually uh, wrapping up webinar details, and then I'm going to be boarding a plane to, for DC. So if any of you are at the workshop and you see me, say hello. Um, a reminder, PERC uh, 23 is in July, the 23rd to the, through the 27th in Portland, Oregon. Um, the EDUCAUSE Annual Conference is October 9th through 12th up in Chicago. And then our Trusted CI NSF Cybersecurity Summit is on October um, 24th through 26th. Uh, registration will be coming out soon. Our uh, call for proposals is closed, I believe. So um, we're gonna polish off our schedule and then we'll announce registration so that people have an idea of what, we, what we're going to be presenting. Um, with that, let's see. So, We've got a question here. Can you talk a little bit more about how you interface with your campus partners, for example, research IT, library, local IT personnel, central IT, et cetera? I think I'll pass it on to Will. <clears throat> sure, yeah. So there's a, a lot of different ways we, we interface with these groups. Research IT, so here at IU, that's called research technologies. We interface with them heavily uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, our group is also involved with uh, managing uh, HIPAA compliance for our central systems, uh, for our central IT department. So that means a lot of that work is facing our central research IT systems. So we sit down with them often, like yearly, uh, and when they're creating new systems to help them document security. Um, and that's on across all of our research systems. So that's just one way we've kind of worked with them to bake in research cybersecurity. Re our researchers don't have to go out and find compliance systems and all that kind of stuff. We've got the compliance and security baked in across all of our research systems. And that's through just constant work with our research technologies division. As far as groups like library, um, we meet with uh, librarians, uh, one of the head librarians, uh, data librarians, who also happens to be our research data steward. Uh, we meet with her bi-weekly just to talk about uh, these uh, IRB software requests that come through our IRB process. Local IT personnel, uh, when we first um, started communicating out this service, we went to the IT pros, the local IT folks for our biggest research departments. We let them know about our service, what kinds of services we provide and what we can help them with. We can essentially, we tell them we can take the uh, research security load off of their hands and they can just refer re their researchers to us. There's also been cases where research, I, or sorry, I, local IT pros have directly asked for our help in setting up uh, or designing some language uh, for 
some researcher facing language for their research systems um, and all kinds of stuff. Like with IRB, uh, we're directly built into the IRB form. So depending on certain answers to IRB questions, people get referred to us. And then with our Office of Research Administration, what happens there is anytime there's a uh, data use agreement or a contract coming in that has specific cybersecurity language in it, they essentially rope us in. And then sometimes we can just answer their question directly. But most often what happens is we tell them, set us up an engagement with the researcher. We'll talk to them real quick, understand things and get back to you. So the relationship looks a little different based on the stakeholder and what that stakeholder does. But we are essentially built in with them and they see us as their cybersecurity group uh, to help them. So one of the things we, one of the things I learned uh, way back when in, in 2007 is when we uh, when I was sent to the School of Medicine to uh, provide research computing systems. And the first question they asked, of course, was, are you HIPAA compliant? Um, HIPAA had just come into being 2005, and no one knew what, what it was or how to spell it. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, so, so the, my boss basically said, OK, if we're going to do this thing, then we're going to have to get everyone on board. So he basically set up an com oversight committee, which had everyone that would but potentially could later say, well, how come we didn't, how come you didn't ask us? So researchers, uh, IT governance folks, compliance folks, IT pros, you name it, they were all on the oversight committee. And what we did was we made sure that the meetings took place and we took notes. And so this idea was so firmly lodged in my brain that when we started Secure My Research, you know, we went out and basically identified absolutely everyone that had anything to do with research in any way, shape, and possible uh, way possible. So this would be all compliance folks, IT, or all of you know, central IT, IT pros, library, um, uh, HIPAA office as a compliance office, the uh, office of sponsored research, uh, IRB, human resources, because they have those initial um, meetings and stuff like that. Uh, so I can't I can't come up with the whole list, but if you look at the paper, the paper has a very comprehensive list of all the stakeholders that do research. So they were all involved before Secure My Research actually was launched as a service, and so they all basically feed people into us at this point because that was kind of the understanding, and vice versa. That sometimes people come to us and we have to either just go to these uh, other stakeholders and get the information so as to, to make it fast and be the one-stop shop. Or in other cases, when, when it is clear that they need to go to some other stakeholder, then, then we will send them. Again, ma matching the pace of research is important. So we, where it is, where we have stronger relationships, let's say, uh, we're able to get that information and, and give it back to us again in, con in concert with, with the stakeholder. We're not trying to step on someone's territory, but Again, having done this, I think in, in the proper way at the very beginning, those relationships are there. And, and, and without those, uh, th this, this would not be possible. I mean, including security office, if you can imagine, this is not coming out of the security office. One of the most important relationships is with the security office. They trust that we would do the right sorts of things. And, and then if there's something that, that comes to us, which is clearly something that's a security governance issue, and we shouldn't be making those decisions, and that goes up. And often we will talk to the security office and not send the researcher to them. Uh, we make every effort to make sure that the, the researcher never gets exposed to governance unless it's absolutely essential because we are the kind of the glue. We are the soft sort of the <laughs> that, 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 uh, that, you know, the, our image is of that of a consultant and, and to, to who people come, you know, voluntarily. We're the problem solver, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think very long, very, yeah, too much information perhaps that uh, more than what Lisa asked, but but basically, yeah, yeah we're very plugged in. A, a good summary of that would be, we spent a lot of time figuring out every single department involved in research, 
if that department governed some kind of process that researchers go through, we built ourselves into that process where appropriate. Where that group kind of just worked with researchers, we said, anytime your researchers have cybersecurity questions, just shoot them our way and we'll take care of it. So for example, um, the, the most exciting thing to me personally, again, this all started with, uh, with DOD compliance and stuff in mind. And indeed, uh, since we have a very large school of medicine, a lot of the a lot of this work was was the the, the usual suspect, which is the compliance, you know, driven types of, of research. But at this point, that's only fifty percent of our customers. A full fifty percent have nothing to do with compliance. And most most excitedly, we are now plugged into the social sciences research center. We can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so Social Sciences Research Center is a group we have here at IU. Um, they're kind of just a, a group that provides research facilitation in multiple different ways across the social sciences. Um, so a very large field of study there. Um, and we identified them as a point of re a point of origin for a lot of researchers to come in. So we just let them know about the services provide. And that's been an excellent group since they have so many different researchers from so many different disciplines coming in. Um, that department knows about all the different types of struggles researchers are facing. Social Sciences Research Center is also developing their own um, solutions to meet those challenges. And we can come in and help them uh, secure those as they're being built. Anything where they're not able to come up with their own good solution, we're able to help them research solutions and that kind of stuff. It's just a really good example of getting plugged into, if you know where your researchers are going, plug yourself into that as a consultant, uh, someone there to help, and you'll just get people coming to you voluntarily, even if it's just to answer a simple question. Where can I go? In? I'm, I'm trying to do this. Where can I go to do that? If there's not a place already, what can we kind of cobble together? Um, how can we like tweak stuff that's available at IU to make this work for us? And the most important thing that we're doing is again, it's relationship management. So the the attempt is is for a researcher once they come to us to make sure they come back to us. So the way we do that is again by saying you come to us, cybersecurity compliance will take care of you. The institution will take care of you. <clears throat> uh, but also we tell them, well, we are now part of your team. Anytime you have anything to do with security or compliance or trustworthiness issues and stuff like that, just, just call us. <clears throat> and so that's what's, I think, lodged us into a lot of individual researcher workflows. Uh, and then of course, larger units such as social sciences research centers or you know other smaller, uh, I mean, social sciences research centers, this is like 50 departments. Uh, but also smaller departments that have a unit, for, uh, and this is not necessarily an IT unit. It could be research coordinators that help people write IRB proposals. So, so we have spent a lot of time over the last three years just going and, and, and either talking with researchers or more importantly with these other people to who researchers go. So this, this is, we think this is, uh, this is the kind of approach that it would take to to properly secure research, because as I said, mostly researchers are have been left alone to their own devices, and no one has any real understanding of what research is, what the researchers do, what their problems are, and these sorts of things. So, without that comprehensive, holistic approach, I don't think this is this is something that can be done. <clears throat> um, we've got a few minutes left uh, for for final questions. I have a I have a logistical question for you. And um, so um, Secure My Research is all based on IU's campus currently. Um, what, so for like logistical challenges, uh, scheduling a meeting, for example, you guys have access to people's busy free calendars. But so um, is that, has that been like um, discussed if you wanted to scale it outward and coordinate with other campuses, like how would that complicate your, your process? If you mean by other campuses, non-IU campuses? Yes. This would be an exceedingly difficult challenge for us because the reason why we are able to do this is we have very deep understanding of our campus. 
So not to say that this is impossible, but you know, we would have to come live on your campus for six months, probably in order to understand how your campus works because the relationships are gonna be very important. So we could do some of this, yes, as, as just a, a simple extension of what we do. But the problem is we, we have to know what the solutions you provide to your researchers and things like that. So I think, I think a better approach is, and this is something that you know, at some, some later date we might consider, but uh, at this point, I, I don't think this is something that's feasible. It's better to teach you to fish, so to speak, and you understand your campus best and you understand your researchers best. Uh, maybe you don't understand your researchers just yet, but, uh, but you know, that using these kinds of techniques, you can. And, and yeah, I understand that it takes some effort to launch this at first, and that's where we can provide a lot of help. <clears throat> but ultimately, a campus has to do this, uh, do this themselves, unless perhaps it's a very small campus and, 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 and potentially we could understand what's going on there. And so, yeah, yeah, it's, we, we have thought of this <laughs> and realized this isn't something that's a, that's a straightforward, simple scaling out from IU. <clears throat> yeah, indeed. Okay, well, um, we've got, oh, we've got a follow-up question here. It looks like important in engagement that, important in an engagement that might bring them in to include not just security in that discussion. Yeah, we don't we don't talk about security. As I said, the, the discussion is about what you want to get done. So people are not necessarily coming to us because of security. They they want to get some research done, and what we're doing is we're making sure that that research gets done and gets done in a trustworthy way. As I said, that's what we're that's what we're um, stressing. So obviously, if it's a HIPAA PHI issue, I mean that's pretty straightforward. They're coming to us for that. But a lot of people are coming to us because, you know, like this climate research uh, example we gave, we literally had a climate researcher come to us because they had heard our talk and they were concerned now about their research. And then we actually helped them with their, you know, with, with installing software that could do, you know, checksums and things like that. So, so indeed, we do not speak the language of cybersecurity at all because I know that would push the researchers away unless they speak to us in that language first. We're saying, what do you want to get done? And we're helping them get their research done. That's that's absolutely the first, you know, absolutely the, 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 the mission number one for us. <clears throat> well, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, I'll just let people type in last, last minute questions, but um, thank you so much for this presentation. This is very exciting, this work that you're doing. Do you have any final comments for us in the audience? No, I, I just uh, I just want to say that uh, yeah, this is this is a huge issue on all, all campuses. Generally, it, it shows up as a as a compliance a compliance thing. People are dealing with DOD and so forth, but it it really should be thought more uh, thought of more holistically because this is there will be more requirements coming. And now there's the NSPM 33, which requires all research basically to be secured. So it is time to start thinking about these things more holistically and not in the way that people have thought. Research cybersecurity is a new field. Tim or Will? No, I, I just think that's a really important uh, thing what Anurag just said. All, cyber, all research is not only going to have cybersecurity requirements, but the way we deliver our service all types of research can also benefit from this, whether or not they have specific cybersecurity requirements. Um, Anurag, can you repeat what's the what's the new regulation coming down the pike? It's called NSPM-33. So it's a presidential memorandum, and this will require any institution that is receiving more than $50 million annually in federal funding to have a research cybersecurity program. So uh, if you are not familiar with this yet, uh, please do so. It's uh, it's being discussed a lot. Uh, and if you have further questions, just, just email me. So we've, we've been, there's also the regulated research community of practice. And if you haven't heard RR COP, if you're not mm -hmm. familiar with this, I, I highly recommend that you join their Slack channel. And that's where all, all things compliance are 
discussed, including an SPM 33 and, and some, some of the other NIST things that have been going on and, and, and uh, NSF, uh, ISAO thing, the Inf Information Security Analysis Organization and so forth. So we, you know, we, we do a lot of compliance stuff. So we were sort of right on top of those kinds of things. So um, I will be uh, posting the recording of this presentation. Thank you again so much for presenting. I'll be uh, posting the recording probably tomorrow. Um, when I do, I'll try to remember to include some of these important links and references. Um, we al we've also had a presentation from the RRCOP, so I can I can reference that as well in, the, in the, the notes. So thank you so much again for presenting, and I hope you guys have a great day. Yep. Thanks. Thank, thank you all. Bye, everyone.